let's shift gears uh, just a little bit and talk about sort of molecular testing for for your colorectal cancer. I mean, there isn't a single disease out there anymore, really, the cancer that you don't do, that a microscope's good enough. You need to do some genetic testing. And, uh, you know, I know that this, we keep moving the bar on this. We keep saying, this is what you should do. And a year later, we said, oh, we didn't mean that. This is what you should do. So, Charlie, you get to set us off. What is the, this is what we should do for today for a patient with metastatic colon cancer? Hey, John, you're so right. This field continues to move. I remember, we all remember when, when cetuximab and panitumumab were first developed, the idea was, oh, if we test for EGFR expression on the tumor, that'll tell us be enough, yeah. who to give it to. In fact, that doesn't predict anything. And what we've ultimately learned is that RAS mutations predict resistance. And that is continuing to evolve because we first thought it was just a portion of the KRAS gene. Now we know it's all RAS genes. What's really helpful is the technology is keeping up, in fact, surpassing what we're learning clinically, namely, whereas it cost billions of dollars to sequence one person's genome 20 years ago, we can now do it very cheaply on clinical samples. So at our center, we're using essentially a next generation sequence platform for about 300 genes, which obviously include RAS and others, and that's been our clinical standard. And it's helpful, obviously, practically, because you know the RAS status, but it's also helpful because you learn about other genes and that you can direct them to other studies. And what would you say is an oncologist who's not got access to that? What tests should they deal, talk with their pathology group? What should they order today to manage a patient yeah. with metastatic they, colon? They, they should insist on all RAS testing, and, and, they, and clearly they gotta get it in real time, right? I mean, and if this, you've done a KRAS in its wild type, send it again? Yes, because we need to know, firstly, KRAS may only be codons 12 and 13 and not 61 and 146. It obviously may not include NRAS. So you need to specifically ask your pathologist, are you getting all the KRAS and all the NRAS uh, components of the genes to know whether they're mutated? Because we know they all predict resistance. The other thing I would say is that uh, they should have an algorithm where if they're RAS wild type, they should, be se they should be sequencing at least for the V600 of BRAF, right? Because we know that's an important predictor of outcome and it also can direct you to important studies. Okay, so RAS, BRAF, what else? Certainly MSI. Uh, you so know, that's we, now in. It was used to be staged. Last year's yes. message was only in stage <laughs> two. This year's message is everybody? Absolutely. Yeah. Be, and as you know, because it, it, it certainly helps us direct adjuvant therapy and now we learn from our studies in immuno-oncology that MSI high tumors are likely to benefit from PD-1 and PD-L1 directed therapies. And we'll come therapies. back to that. So yeah, so now RAS, MSI, anything else? BRAF? Well, I, you know, from a practical standpoint, I'd say those three things are critical. The, the others are interesting, but I'm not sure that- HER2, HER2, HER2? Well, I think, you know, there's some data that one of the resistant, primary, secondary resistant of EGFR is HER2 amplification. Mm -hmm. And there's some data from last year that shows that patients who were KRAS wild type but had HER2 positive and FISH or IHC, they did not respond to EGFR drugs. I'm not sure if it's ready for prime time. We don't do it in our institution. Um, I would like to see more data. Definitely a preclinical data supports that for sure. And one of the mechanisms of secondary resistance is also that HER2 amplification may be secondary resistance as well. So I will, personally, I would like to see more data. I don't test for HER2 on my patients at this time. You don't get it in your next gen. Are you ordering it on top? Well, is, you're, you're obviously referring to the Heracles mm. data, which is a small study looking at trastuzumab and lipatinib in HER2 overexpressing colon, which really looks interesting in terms of response. So the problem is, is it is not part of our routine. And what happens is you call up the pathologist and say, can you do me a favor? Can you do HER2 because of this promising? And, and provocative data, but it isn't a routine at our center. I don't know if the others. Are yeah, there. I was going to ask. So it's not routine at our center, but again, I, I, I think that it's, it's placing is probably in later line. I mean, it's, it's a dynamic mm. uh, process. It's not uh, a process meaning that you take the tumor at, at diagnosis and unlike KRAS, uh, you know, and you can rely on it you're probably better off if you have access to HER2 directed therapies to do that later, either through a biopsy or even a liquid biopsy could give you these answers. HER2? Um, not yet, mm. but I think it's coming. But I think it points to something very important is that tissue is precious. Mm. And that's what we're learning more and more is that though in colon cancer specimens, if we have a resection specimen, we have a lot more tissue, but there are some people that are diagnosed in the metastatic setting where we have a liver biopsy. And so what we've been working on is education among around getting 
not fine needle, not fine needle aspirates, but core biopsies. And if you're gonna send off the tissue, try to get as much as you can in one shot so you have that information for later. And then also the importance of when you send off next generation sequencing, just an education around it, doesn't give you MSI. Yeah. I got That's a patient a right test. now who's treated at your crosstown rival and moved to the DC area. And the only biopsy they had, which is reasonable, was a colonoscopic biopsy. And so mm -hmm. here's a patient with metastatic colon cancer that we had no RAS, even RAS status on. Um, and so we ended up having to go back and get more tissue in, in order uh, to do that. Let me just ask, I, I know how you guys do it. I know I, I, what we do at our shop is we are doing more and more partnering with a, um, a, a profiling company where we're getting, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out if broad profiling, I like to say, instead of ordering a Kim 7, is ordering the Kim 20 and seeing what happens, or, ordering everything and getting that back to see if that makes sense. And, and so how are, you're doing it internally. Are you guys doing it internally or sending out? No, we're doing it internally just on a limited basis, meaning just the target. The ones that are approved and PRS proven. And RAS, yeah. BRF, and we're doing, you know, uh, M MSI on everyone. Yeah. So we're just doing it, doing it targeted. And if we need an expanded uh, panel, we're actually sending out. Yeah, so that's fine. What are you guys doing? Commercial next-gen sequencing. Commercial next-gen. We have internal, um, uh, kit that we use that has 20 to 30 actionable markers. It's not the whole full panel. So we test th those first and if you need to go beyond that, we, we will order using commercially available kits. Yeah, and I've been advising those folks in, in the smaller community groups to consider these commercial groups because it's changing so much as Absolutely. you say and, and tissue is precious. So kind of get it all when you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then your pathology department usually was the pushback before. I don't think they care as much mm -hmm. anymore. It seems that they're happy to have somebody, although some pathology departments feel stronger about that. Is there any other, you know, emerging target, you know, PIC-C, should, 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 we, should we know other stuff um, on patients, John? The one thing I would add is as we all start to include these multi-gene panels, and clearly you want to do MSI, but one thing that we've periodically discovered is before you even get the MSI or independent of the MSI, you find these patients where the pathologist calls, the report says there are a litany of mutations you know, just in the sort of, and they don't even know what the mutations mean, but there are so many they can't count. Mm. And when that happens, and this has been my experience, those are people who may respond to immuno-oncology approaches because they're hypermutated. So make sure that you get everything out. If you use those platforms, make sure you get everything out of them.